The war in Ukraine has marked the very first case in history where crypto has played a significant role in a military conflict. Right after Russia invaded Ukraine one year ago, crypto donations started flowing from all over the world to support the country's resistance. In total, around $200 million worth of crypto was donated to Ukraine-related causes in the past 12 months. Digital currencies have been a vital resource for thousands of Russians who opposed Putin's invasion and fled their country. But the war has also shown the dark side of crypto. Russian militia groups and hackers have used the digital currencies to circumvent sanctions and support the Kremlin's war effort. So has crypto really been a force for good in the war in Ukraine? And which side of the conflict has used it in the most effective way? I tried to find out in my conversation with Andrew Fearman, the head of sanction strategy at Chainalysis. I'm Giovanni. On this show, we challenge the ideas that shape the world of crypto. In each episode, we assess a crypto narrative, a macroeconomic outlook, or a potentially disruptive technology. Only the most solid ideas will make it to the other side. So Andrew, your team at Chainalysis recently published a report where you discuss the impact of crypto on the Ukraine war one year after the invasion. So what would you say was the main impact of digital currencies on the conflict? Yeah, absolutely. So it's been a really interesting year. I mean, we, we first saw immediately after the outset of the war uh, the people rally behind Ukraine and the Ukrainian government in setting up the you know crypto-related donations to support uh, the Ukrainian efforts uh, against Russia. And we quickly saw just mere months after the start of the war, over $50 million, uh, you know, almost immediately go into, you know, Ukrainian donation support. And as of today, you know, that's well over $70 million. So, uh, you know, we've seen a quick adoption on the global scale. We've seen a lot of people globally willing to help and support and the borderless, you know, benefit of crypto really makes that easier. And, so while that was the outset of what we saw, um, that got us thinking too to another point, which is this is also really one of the first open source wars that that we're getting involved in. And so thinking about um, you know everything that's available from social media, Twitter feeds, um, you know, being able to see what's going on in real time, that had us also thinking about well, if we're seeing all of the good that this could be doing, um, where could it be going bad? And and who could be leveraging crypto for the wrong reasons. And so that's kind of where we started looking into things like these militia and propaganda groups, um, where we started looking at you know, broader scale sanctions evasion potential um, and, and the use of ransomware a, as a political tool from the hacktivist perspective. Yeah, and now let's talk about uh, the Russians. So we talked about how Ukrainians have been uh, raising funds in order to um, basically resist uh, providing aid to the country and so on. But we also saw that uh, Russians have also used crypto in the conflict. So maybe can you, can you give us some of the numbers that uh, surprised you the most or the most significant numbers in terms of how Russians have used crypto in the conflict? So uh, some of the numbers I like to focus on are around the militia and propaganda groups. And so when I talk about those types of groups, what do I mean? Um, these are these are groups, uh, particularly on social media, who are soliciting donations to support either the war up uh, the war upkeep or you know to maintain their writing on the the propaganda outlets um, that they're you know that they're engaging on, and so essentially requesting donations to help support via crypto. So when we think about the types of things this money might be used for. Um, while we certainly aren't sure exactly where it ends up uh, from, a, you know, the goal is ultimately to take the crypto, transfer it to fiat and use it to purchase supplies. Um, when it comes to these militia groups, uh, they actually get quite specific in a lot of instances about what they're looking to buy with with the money that they receive. Um, you know, I, I pulled one just for example today, but uh, a recent request was for uh, helmets, tactical headphones, winter boots, and winter gloves. So when we're thinking about the types of things that they're spending money on, we're not talking about hundreds of thousands or multi-million dollar items. We're talking about, you know, items that, you know, keep these soldiers going during the conflict. So $5 million, while it may not sound like a lot in comparison, uh, can certainly be a benefit towards these militia groups. 
Yeah, and so I wanted to dive a little bit more into this. So when you talk about militias, we are not talking about uh, the Russian government. Yeah, so these are going to be your grassroots organizations. So, I mean, we're not talking about Russia state-funded donations, which is also, you know, probably one of the reasons we're seeing such smaller numbers. Um, we're really looking at, you know, individual actors. So somebody who's on the front, somebody who's, you know, trying to help, uh, you know, provide more military resources to the front, um, whether they have connections in Moscow to move those, you know, goods into the Donbass region um, or not, um, you know, they're essentially just trying to collect through whatever outlets they have available to them. And so that's where you see things like bulletproof vests or drones, um, you know, being purchased uh, or, or stating that they'll be purchased with the donations that they receive. So that's interesting because we know that the U.S. Treasury Department, uh, other regulatory bodies also in Europe have imposed sanctions on uh, Russian entities because of the war in Ukraine. And so I was wondering why haven't those sanctions worked in terms of preventing those pro-Russia fundraising activities with crypto? So I wouldn't say that they're not working. There's been a significant decrease um, in the engagement of these exchanges um, you know, since these actors identified. So I think one thing that's important to understand is it's not necessarily the case that these actors are operating from exchanges. It's that they're having non-custodial wallets. So they're holding their own wallets and then transferring funds out to exchanges um, in order to get their fiat transfer. So I think, you know, obviously uh, without detection, these actors' uh, wallets may not be known by uh, an exchange that was receiving funds from them. So it, it's really important for the, the blockchain analytics ecosystem to be monitoring these groups, flagging them and giving exchanges the opportunity to make those assessments as well. So now let's try to explain how that works in practice. So if a Russian sanctioned entity receives some crypto donations in their no custodial wallet and decides to cash out through an exchange, how can that entity be stopped? It's a great question. So that's how blockchain, that's where blockchain analytics comes into play. So, um, you know, exchanges uh, are often using blockchain analytics tools um, or even sometimes their own internal tools in order to flag transactions and activity with specific actors. Um, so when an entity is identified as, or an address is identified as belonging to one of these groups, um, the blockchain analytics companies will, uh, you know, provide that information into their product, which then uh, exchanges can utilize to monitor their transaction. One thing to keep in mind too is that uh, exchanges cannot stop funds from coming inbound, um, it, but it's what they do with those funds once they receive them um, that really matters. So I think context is a little bit important there, but essentially what will happen is um, on an inbound transaction, so where an exchange would be receiving funds from that group, um, they'll get an alert when those funds come in and then they can choose to take the um, relevant regulatory action, depending on what their jurisdiction is. Uh, alternatively, on outbound transactions, um, so let's say uh, a customer at an exchange wanted to go donate to one of these organizations, uh, those funds um, could be notified and alerted before they are, are sent outbound uh, by the exchange themselves. So uh, as you said, those actors like Task Force, Karusic, and other the militia groups are not very sophisticated in the way they use crypto. So uh, let's say that they learn the lesson and they see that by sending um, crypto to exchanges that have some ties with the US financial system, they are likely to get their money blocked or frozen. But what if they develop a more sophisticated approach? Is there a way they can move their funds and cash out through other venues? So that's where we've seen the, the high-risk exchange usage. And, and while the high-risk exchange haven't been as used, the thing is that we also see, keep in mind, is um, that OFAC and, and other US regulators, including FinCEN, you know, are, are keeping track of, of who these operators are in the space. And you know, we've seen Garantex get sanctioned by OFAC. We've seen Bitslotto, um, which was also another well-known uh, you know, exchange in Russia that was facilitating ransomware payments and money laundering um, get subject to a FinCEN order, which is, um, you know, the financial crimes, uh, you know, 
regulator in the US as well. So I think, you know, in these high risk exchanges being used, the more they're used for illicit activity, uh, the more they end up being on, uh, you know, on target lists for, for regulatory bodies and sanctioning bodies like OFAC or, or others. Right. But if they are outside the jurisdiction of the US and they don't touch the US dollar, uh, then they can continue operate. But I guess that's not really feasible, right? Conceptually, but also if they want to interact with, you know, regulated exchanges, um, you know, the ecosystem will be able to see the types of activity that they're engaging in. And, um, you know, exchanges or financial institutions that are subject to US jurisdiction may de-risk doing business with them, which, which limits their accessibility to uh, the global ecosystem. So now let's touch upon the role of ransomware attacks in the war in Ukraine. So in a, a recent report that you published not long ago, you established that in 2022, around $450 million were stolen in crypto, were stolen through ransomware attacks. And the majority of them were paid to entities that were believed to be based in Russia. So can you tell us more about what entities are we talking about? Yeah, sure. So um, Conti, which is a prolific uh, Russia-based ransomware actor, uh, obtained over $60 million um, from victims in 2022. And um, where we really wanted to highlight it in for this report is, you know, what the intent and purpose behind uh, a lot of their attacks are. And, you know, when it comes to ransomware payments, a lot of the time uh, bad actors have, you know, some sort of political agendas behind what they're doing. So uh, Conti actually had uh, uh, notified uh, in that, the day after the war started, actually, um, that they're officially announcing their full support for the Russian government. So Conti as a group was at least standing behind uh, the Russian government in, in their activities. Um, additionally, we saw another pro-Russian hacktivist group by the name of Kilnet uh, trying to target countries that are supporting Ukraine. In addition, they've even gone to social media to solicit donations, uh, but those numbers are, are are pretty insignificant in comparison to the to the ransomware numbers. Okay, so that's quite impressive because if we assume that all those ransomware funds were paid to Russian entities that supported the war in Ukraine, that would mean that Russia basically managed to gather more crypto than Ukraine in 2022. So again, this is the amount uh, that has been uh, made, ransomware payments made. Uh, it doesn't fully account for any ransomware assets that were seized. So um, I don't have those numbers offhand. I'll have to come back to you. Um, but a portion of that, you know, very well could have been seized by law enforcement or, um, you know, through uh, coordinated efforts between exchanges and law enforcement. Um, so that 456 million number isn't explicitly all ill-gotten gains necessarily. Thanks a lot, Andrew, for giving your perspective on these numbers. And uh, yeah, uh, let's keep in touch for probably other uh, chain analysis reports that you're going to release in the future. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Giovanni.